This is the Human Action Podcast, where we debunk the economic, political, and even cultural myths of the days. Here's your host, Dr. Bob Murphy. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Human Action Podcast. This is going to be an unusual, out-of-the-box episode. I'm going solo, and I wanted to go over some thought experiments or considerations that I think will shed light on how real-world financial markets work, and in particular, how market prices, particularly the term structure of interest rates, helps to coordinate consumption and production across long stretches of time. So this is something that's actually intimately related to the Austrian school because Eugen von Bombavirk uh, is arguably the father of modern capital and interest theory. And I'll, some mainstream economists might say, what are you talking about? That's Irving Fisher. But if you go and read Irving Fisher's book on, I think he calls it a theory of interest. Well, he had different, different books, but I think one of them was called that. The, the beginning, he dedicates the book to Bombavrik and another economist saying, you know, I, I don't remember exactly how Fisher put it, but basically I'm just building on the work of giants here. Okay, so th that's why I thought what I'm going to get into in this episode is appropriate for the Human Action Podcast because, again, the last third, let's call it, of this material is going to be hip deep in how financial markets work and how they use people's preferences for the timing of consumption in order to achieve intertemporal efficiency. And, so, and that's a, a very Austrian thing. And I wouldn't have fully appreciated it had I not done my doctoral work on Bombavrik. Having said that, the beginning is a bit fanciful and I just don't want to mislead anybody. What I'm going to say I think is defensible from an Austro-libertarian point of view, but this is not standard Austrian economics or libertarian property rights theory. All right, so I, I don't want to mislead anybody. But in any event, with, enough with the housekeeping. Let me give some more background before I jump into what the, the main idea is going to be here. I recently interviewed Scott Horton. Uh, he has a book that, as I'm... Recording this, it's not yet released, but possibly by the time this episode drops, it will have come out, uh, called Provoked, Scott Horton's book is, which deals with the fact of how he thinks the Western nations um, backed Putin into a corner kind of thing. And as part of his research for that book, he had sent me a chapter on what happened with the collapse of the Soviet Union and the attempt to convert to capitalism. And there was a, a large amount of state-owned enterprises that needed to be privatized. And so that that whole issue was on my radar. And also when I was in college, I don't want to shock anybody, but I was a bit of a nerd. And I was on the debate team. And one semester, the resolution I forget the exact wording of it, but it had to do with the Earth's ocean resources. And so my partner, who was also steeped in Austro-Libertarian theory, and I, we never lost with the affirmative, and we made a case for privatizing the oceans. And we never lost when we were arguing that. We did lose sometimes when we were on the flip side. Um, but in any event, because it, it was just funny, the the kids going up against us, like we were talking about, oh, yeah, we just privatized the oceans. You know, people can own segments of the ocean and you can tag whales and stuff so that if your whale goes into somebody else's quadrant, you know, they return it just like if your dog runs in your neighbor's yard, it's not like your neighbor owns your dog, that kind of stuff. And the, it was just such a ostensibly nutty idea that the other teams, there was like, oh, and we were just, you can imagine. I was younger, but I was still me. I was crushing them. Like they didn't even, they didn't know what to do. It was like I was Neo fighting with one hand. So anyway, that's all in the background as well. And so that is my lead in to explain recently. Um, somebody asked me, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving a lot of details out, but the gist of it, what we need to know for this episode is somebody saying, Hey, if the sky's the limit and you'll see that no pun intended there. If, uh, 
Trump gets reelected and, you know, you're just advising him and, you know, and I said, okay, sure, I can play that game. And I, I have written lots of stuff over the years on uh, phasing out, letting people opt out of Social Security and how you could sell off federal assets. Uh, I, I had a, a calculation for an Econ Lib article about you could come up with $1.6 without even trying in terms of liquid assets that could be sold back into the private sector, so forth. And so I'm going through that stuff. And person's like, yeah, this is all fine and good, but no, think big. So I said, all right, well, right now, outer space suffers from what's called a tragedy of the commons. And specifically, in 1967, there was a um, global treaty brokered by the UN that I'm paraphrasing here, but basically said outer space is the common property of all of humanity. Nobody can go own the moon, for example. Okay, and you can see why they would specify that in the 60s, why it was important to, like, hey, let's make this clear before the either the Soviets or the Americans start uh, claiming stuff. Um, and then I think it was in 2015, the U.S. government, and I don't remember if they just unilaterally declared this or if this was part of some kind of you know international negotiation, but I believe they declared... Sure, we're not violating the treaty we signed back in 67, but you know what? If somebody goes up and uh, harvests resources from outer space, they can keep them. Like, you know, that's theirs, all right? And so the, to me, it's, it seemed analogous to the problem that was plaguing the oceans back when my partner and I were debating this stuff in college. And so the idea was, well, you know, there's overfishing, Right. Why is it when back when they were, you know, whalers would go around and hunt the whales and so forth, part of the issue, or even not just the ocean, but even just uh, bodies of water, you know, inside the borders of the country where it's common property. And so, oh, you have boating regulations and people can go out and fish. And that's why you have to have seasons and stuff like that. And you can only fish during this time and you can only catch so much. And and the reason they have those sort of arbitrary rules in place, in some places they even say things like, oh, you you can't use a, a, a net that's bigger than such and such. Like It's like they deliberately handicap the fishing operation to make it less efficient. And um, as opposed to just limiting the catch size, right? Or just making you pay a higher price based on how much stuff you take out. So that was kind of the the problem. So we're saying you, you'd have a much more rational usage of the resources and the uh, eliminating again what's called the tragedy of the commons. So if there's like a common pasture land and everybody with animals is allowed to let their animals graze, but you're not allowed to like fence off an area and say, No, this is my land, get your animals off here. It's like, hey, no, it's a, you you can't do that. It's open, it's, it's open to everybody, all the ranchers. Well then, the the pasture doesn't isn't allowed to re replenish itself, right? Because if you don't let your animals hit an area, hoping to let it grow, some other guy is going to come and let his animals graze there. So you might as well take it while you can, right? So the way you avoid that outcome and that over usage or over consumption of a natural resource is by codifying property rights. All right. So I was saying something like that ultimately is going to need to happen that people need to know who owns that asteroid. And it's not going to be a good system. If it's like, oh, well, nobody can own an asteroid, but hey, whoever lands something there and digs up all the minerals, those minerals are yours, finders, keepers, that that's actually not a good system. Okay. So I was explaining that stuff and just coming up with ballpark estimates and folks, don't get hung up on this part. That where we're going with this is what I want to focus on for this episode, the economics of it. But I was, I was saying these numbers could be enormous. If this system, you know, you have to have all the governments sign off on it. Like the, the companies that were investing in these property rights, you know, to buy these titles or deeds, uh, they would need to know that this was going to be respected, right? And so you could bring in blockchain and smart contracts and all that stuff to at least codify, hey, this is what the deal was back in, 2030, when we paid this many millions of dollars to say we own this particular asteroid or, or we have the rights to 
any minerals that we find there, you know, that kind of thing, that if it takes 20 years to actually go up there and get it, well, how do you know if anyone's going to respect that title 20 years from now? Well, at least if it's on the blockchain somehow, the record will be public, right? So you, no matter what, if somebody goes up there with space-based lasers or something, you, you know, it, it, it perhaps be might makes right, but at least it will be crystal clear that that person's violating what the deal was, you know, back in the day. And especially if it's the descendants of governments that all signed this treaty or whatever. All right, so that's kind of the framework. Again, let's not get hung up on the issue. Partly you might say, well, what would Rothbard say? It's, it's hard to translate because his recommendation for the Soviet Union as it fell apart um, was basically saying uh, the workers who like went to this car factory, let those workers become the owner. And then, then once you're the owner, you know, you can sell it off, right? Like if the workers get assigned shares, then they're allowed to go sell it to the highest bidder if they want. And then ultimately, you would think the corporation would end up in the hands of the, um, you know, the most capable owners and so on, who are th the ones that most likely to make the profit maximizing decisions. That's how, how markets work. But the idea is, you know, who gets the initial allocation of these titles? And so that was Rothbard's idea that just give it to the workers. But here it's... It's not obvious because it's it's not like, oh, well, right now, who's mining all these asteroids or who's building an observatory on the dark side of the moon? Well, well nobody is, right? And so it's it's not clear how you would translate that. So anyway, um, what I, what I want to focus on now, though, is I was just in my head kind of going back and forth with what uh, critics might say. And so one thing that popped out is this thing, look at these numbers could be huge. You actually had a system up and running. And uh, and the other element I mentioned was to, to say that it would be like if the, the proceeds would be distributed directly to people, you know, the citizens, as opposed to, you know, into the hands of the government, because, you know, they're going to, they're going to waste it and so forth. And they're, they're not going to share it the way they should. So anyway, if the idea is, okay, we said humanity owns the solar system, let's go ahead and sell it off and give the proceeds to the owners, right? On a <laughs> per capita basis like that. Again, very arbitrary. It's not something that John Locke and Rothbard would have dreamed up, but in terms of just saying something fanciful, that's, you know, a, a speculation. Okay. So my point was though, that if you start just plugging in ballpark estimates, the numbers could be enormous. That there's estimates floating around that the, the minerals, like the economic value of the moon could be over a quadrillion dollars. Now, someone's not going to pay a quadrillion dollars today for access to the moon because, you know, those are future dollars. So already you got to bring in the idea of discount rates. And also, it's not just like somebody selling you um, a mansion that's going to be finished next year, but it's, and it's located in Florida. And so, oh, well, I got to wait. So I'm not going to pay as much today for that. It's not just the time delay, but it's also, no, it's like somebody selling you the rights to build on some tropical island that right now is completely uninhabited and there's nothing there. So it's like, oh, you got to take into account unified. Yeah, it'd be cool if there was a mansion there, but I got to ship all of the part, the you know construction materials there and I got to get all the workers in there to build the thing. And so you obviously would pay much less for just a plot of land somewhere inaccessible than you would for an already built mansion with the land that it's on, you know, in Connecticut. Okay. So that applies much more so to the case of space-based resources that even if you had a bunch of technical experts and others giving you ballpark estimates of what they think, you know, oh, that asteroid right there, what you think it might contain. And, you know, right now what would be the market value of that and da, 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 and you go through that it's, uh, there's a lot of expense in order to go extract it. Okay. So maybe a better analogy would be like oil that was really down deep under the ocean floor. And if you bought the rights to, to go get it and then it was yours, still, you wouldn't pay as much as oil that's, uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia or something that's really easy to, to bring to market. Okay. But again, having said all that still, we're talking about such a vast quantity of potential 
resources, even if they're still decades away from coming online, as it were, that the amount you could raise via an auction in the near future, once you got the whole system up and running. And again, it would be critical that the thing looked pretty robust and, and dependable, right? Because nobody's going to want to spend a lot, like I say, in the near future for something that really isn't going to come to fruition for 15, 25 years later. So they would have to solve that element, but assuming they could, um, in principle, there could be a ton of money, right? And so let's say there could be a one-shot injection when the thing was up and running of 25% of global GDP. And then think of what that would do if everybody, you know, all the citizens got a distribution from, you know, their share of the solar system's resources. Okay, that's kind of the, the idea. So I just wanted to walk through with you folks now the economics of, because it's kind of interesting, how, how could that help us today? Right, so so let let's just assume away you know other objections that you may have thought of at this to this point, but let's I got say it's a it's a twenty five percent boost in um, global income, and that's that's online a few years from now once this auctioning off mechanism the the, the delineation of the property titles and so forth and they set up smart contracts or whatever so at least everybody knows. It's going to be crystal clear if some government down the road reneges on this promise. So, okay, so one could start saying, "Oh, geez, with all that money, you know, the poor countries could they could build new housing and they could build hospitals and schools, and in richer countries, you know, people that would help them with their health care costs and so forth." And you, know, you could just start going through all the things that people could uh, do if their income real, in real terms went up 25%. And then I realized, though, that an obvious objection that a, a critic could raise, who just said, this is nuts, what are you talking about? This is all just made up stuff, is they could say, wait a minute, even on your own terms, let's say it takes five years to get this thing all up and running, and then at that point forward, there's a, a period where there's this huge flow year after year of new and you know investors bidding on property titles as they get specified and defined and auctioned off and all that stuff. And you say, still on your own terms, even in your own goofy thought experiment, th those extraterrestrial resources aren't actually available for production. It's all in people's heads, minds. And maybe they're well-founded expectations, right? People are putting their real money on the line. It's not just going to be wild-eyed speculations. It's not going to be people going to NASA or the Chinese government or something and making ludicrous over-the-top projections. But this is why you should fund our research program and our expert and our rocket building because look at what we'll be able to bring to you in six years. That no, here if it's your own money or you know shareholders, you're going and raising venture capital to do this the people whose money is on the line are going to really want to be assured that this is real. Like that we really do have that, or not that we don't have it today, but we do have a plausible plan for actually going and getting all that, those minerals that are on asteroid Z714, right? So still the point was, or is, how, how can that reduce poverty and build schools and give people fancier cars and so on on earth in the year 2030, if at best humanity is going to finally start bringing some of those resources home or enjoying, you know, if they're setting up zero G manufacturing operations or something in the, in earth's orbit or whatever, you know, whatever the things are that they're, they're buying the rights to do, it's still going to take a longer time horizon for that stuff to start yielding, tangible benefits to people living on earth, right? And so you could, you could plausibly understand, you can understand someone saying this is impossible. Like you economists with your goofy, you know, financial markets can pull things forward in time and, and, and no, they can't, they, they can't. It's not like you literally have a time machine and that you're able to go forward when humanity will be fantastically wealthier. Let's stipulate because of all this space-based activity and harvesting of resources and, 
production that isn't possible on earth and that sort of thing. And yes, maybe 50 years from now, that will be great. And I can understand how humanity's standard of living would be a lot higher, but us just getting the institutional framework set up to be able to accommodate that, how can that all of a sudden result in a, a, a noticeable boost in the standard of living? Okay. So that, that's the objection that I want to spend the rest of this episode addressing because I, I think it's actually ill-founded, even though superficially that sounds like it's a slam dunk and that the person proposing, you know, auctioning off space-based resources in order to help cash-strap governments deliver, you know, goodies to their people, that that, that just doesn't work physically. Okay, so one immediate response, if, if some, let's, let's assume it's a progressive leftist type, brings that up, is for me to say, okay, wh what are your recommendations instead? And they would say things like, oh, we want to raise the minimum wage and have a Green New Deal and uh, large subsidies, which would include like large subsidies to clean power, and that's going to create good paying jobs and um, the renewable sector, and we can shift away from our reliance on fossil fuels, and so that's going to um, reduce climate change pressures, and, da, 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 and they start going through all this stuff. And, um, you know, we'll, we'll have a, a, a high tax rate on the wealthy, and that will bring all kinds of revenue, and or if you're an MMT person, we could say, yeah, we're going to realize these artificial constraints are bogus, and we can start running the printing press and just spend money as far as um, the natural capacity of the economy and its slackness allows, blah, blah, blah. And I say, okay, and so you think, right, if, if the governments of the world followed your advice, it would radically transform everybody's standard of living, at least, you know, within a few years, right? And they would say, oh, yeah, absolutely. If everybody just followed my wisdom, then the world would be so much better. You say, okay. But, you know, so you're admitting in your model of the world, we can have a sphere placed around the earth, you know, at least hypothetically or, or, or in our imagination, not allowing anything from the outside of that sphere to come in. And you're admitting that just by changing what humans are doing day to day, changing their activities and where they go to work and things like that and what they choose to build when they're at work and so on, just the way human society is organized right now, you agree humanity could be fantastically better off in terms of standard of living if they just followed your advice. And the person, you know, hopefully would, would, would agree, yes. They say, okay, so what I'm saying is the way you harness markets to achieve that outcome, which you admit is technologically feasible, is through the kind of stuff I'm talking about, or that's one avenue of doing it, right? That, in other words, that person thought they had a trump card by saying, no, Murphy, this idea of using the revenue obtained from auctioning off space resources, which currently either don't have any owner or is owned by humanity, which kind of effectively is the same thing, that you're, that that's illusory. It, it can't be that earthlings today benefit from that. And that's, you know, somebody who's poor in Bangladesh all of a sudden can afford a nicer car or house just because some capitalist thinks, oh, I just spent a bunch of money. And so now in 20 years, any goal that we find on asteroid X719 is mine, that, that there's, you know, that new goal hasn't come to earth yet. So how could that possibly, but I'm saying they're admitting, they, they think if we tax that capitalist and just hand the money out to a bunch of the poor people in Bangladesh, then it can work. Okay. So I, I hope I'm getting my point across that they believe it's physically, technologically possible for humanity to have a much higher standard of living. And it, part of that could just include not having wars anymore, right? We could certainly, that's that's an engineering possibility for humanity to stop blowing each other up. And instead of making more tanks and missiles, they could instead make other things. 
make cars and microscopes. And that right there would do a lot for certain pockets of people living around the world to improve their standard of living in the near term. Okay. So my point is before you have a knee jerk reaction and say, no Murphy, the prospect of having this huge influx of resources 20 years down the road from outside the system coming in. And that's, what's going to augment our productivity at that time, that there's no way that can be anticipated and boost our standard of living. Now I'm saying that's not correct because most people think there's plenty of silly government policies in place right now that if we just tweaked would unleash human productivity. Okay. So I'm saying we all kind of agree that by making changes to certain policies right now, humanity in the very near term could be much better off. Okay. So that's one thing. Uh, just to go on that a little bit, I also sometimes think libertarian economist types or, or people, you know, libertarians who are very well-versed in economics, I'm saying you have to be a professional economist. They're sometimes, I think, too quick to rush to the, the lesson of scarcity and that to say, you know, oh, all these progressives just think, oh yeah, get free healthcare, this, and they don't know about scarcity. And so, yes, there always is scarcity outside the Garden of Eden, that's true. But on the other hand, uh, libertarian types also will share memes, you know, showing a futuristic cityscape with flying cars and whatever and say, you know, this is the future we could have had if we had elected Ron Paul. All right, now, obviously, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but it's also serious, right? That if we never had the Fed and we never had an income tax and all these other things, um, I do think humanity right now would be way richer than is currently the case, such that maybe it would be standard that it, you could just walk into a doctor's office and get, quote, free health care, at least for basic services. Just like right now, you can go into a restaurant in the United States um, and when you're ordering your meal, you, you could just get wa a glass of water and they're not even going to charge you for that. Or you're, uh, you're on a road trip, you actually don't need gasoline and you just stop and you go into a gas station, you go to the bathroom and they don't charge you for that. Okay, so I'm just saying we're wealthy enough right now that certain things are just free, even though, yeah, there is technically an economic cost involved, but it's so minuscule compared to our capacity for output that you don't actually charge people for that. And so in the same way, I'm saying you could imagine... Put it this way. Imagine we were in the Star Trek, the next generation world or galaxy. If you if you watch that show. All right. I don't think there'd be people dying because they didn't have enough health insurance coverage to pay for cancer treatments in a world like that, where they could just be, you know, scan you for two seconds and cure you of cancer. All right. That, that it, would just be, it would be so cheap for them. They would do it just for goodwill for their other customers or patients that had longer term maintenance issues, okay? So that's just a long way of saying that don't be so quick to just dismiss people when they're big dreamers about what they think is possible that I think actually, even with given levels of technology, the potential of how much richer humanity could be in material terms, I think sometimes we underestimate and that we don't fully appreciate how destructive and wasteful government policies really are. It's not just government. Like, I'm a Christian, so I think, yeah, if everybody loved each other and, you know, do unto others what you wish they would do to you and turn the other cheek and stuff like that, that would also, even in a, a society that obeyed the non-aggression principle if everybody was very greedy and envious and lustful and, you know, all these other things and wicked, that would keep us materially poorer than if they weren't. All right. But um, certainly the people, the listeners of this podcast will focus on government policies that keep humanity poor. All right. So there's that stuff. Okay. But let's get more specific here about the, um, the timing element and how, how is it to, that, what would I mean when I say financial markets in a sense can pull those resources forward so yes, there's there's not a time machine. However, there can be things like this. I'll, I'll get into, I'll, I'll, I'll be like 
peeling the layers of an onion here. It's like Shrek, all right? Ogres are very, uh, have many layers. So first cut, if you say, like, how, how could it be, Bob, that, again, I get a big dividend from this, these space-based resources because I'm an earthling. How does that make me better off? If it's not the case that we're actually importing, you know, semiconductors that were made in a low G environment, and that's why they're better than the ones made on Earth or whatever. You know, how, how can that be? Well, one thing is what financial markets do, among other services, is they rearrange the ownership of cash flows for the depending on people's appetites for um, present consumption versus saving for higher amount of consumption down the road. And so if somebody gets something that has a present, you know, you get a something that has a, a present market value of $20,000 and you're thinking, oh, I could go spend this. I could just go, about, go out and buy a, you know, $20,000 vehicle or I could go on a vacation or whatnot and spend up to $20,000. $20, or I could, if I have a, a mortgage on my house, I could just use that and pay down the principal. Okay, and so, and maybe so instead of having 28 years left on my house, now I only have 24 years left on my mortgage just because I pay, I transfer that claim to the bank. So what's happening there is I didn't consume that extra income that was, you know, my, my portion of the dividend of the, you know, the auction fund or whatever you want to call it. I didn't consume it. Instead, I saved it. And what did I do specifically? I paid down the principal balance on my mortgage. And then the bank in turn, or whoever the mortgage holder is, if they effectively just put it on their balance sheet on the asset side and they sit on it and say, oh, before we had, you know, a, oh, I forget the number, what I say, a 28-year mortgage, and now that turned into a 24-year mortgage, but we've got this asset sitting on the balance sheet. So they're still kind of the same as they were. It's just... Um, you know, one of their assets went down in market value, and that was offset by the addition of this other asset. Okay. So there, it, nobody is consuming more, if that's what you chose to do with your extra income. So we don't have to explain, well, gee, the, that future flow of resources from outer space isn't allowing someone to eat more tuna fish today on Earth. So how could it? Well, right. So the extent that households saved that windfall income, then there's no problem. And it's fine. And it, the households, though, they really do feel wealthier. They really are in financial terms wealthier because now, again, when, when they do their assets and liabilities, their liability in terms of their mortgage balance is now that much lower. Well, the 20000 I think I said, that they paid off. Okay. And so you just, ex notice you just extended the window there that if, the mortgage time elapsing went from 28 years down to 24 and the bank by stipulation in this example is just going to sit on the asset. And then when the 24 year mortgage gets extinguished, they just start drawing down that, you know, the, the payment you made. And that's how they get back to the, you know, that's how they're made whole. So the, their flow of, revenue from their point of view, they can manage it such that their cash flows are the same as if you kept paying your mortgage the whole time and that you didn't prepay. If folks get what I'm saying. Okay. So notice you've pushed out the consumption or the tapping into that extra burst of income at 24 years and the, the numbers I was just making up. All right. So it's not that the household today by its choices means somebody's consumption went up today. No, it's this example you pushed it out 24 years and 24 years from now, maybe it is possible that some of the stuff from the moon or whatever is flowing in and it is actually making a material difference in the production possibilities here on earth. Okay. So that's just one way of seeing it. And then you can say, okay, yeah, sure. So if everybody just used it to pay down debt and also there were enough creditors willing to just take those things and sit on it, fair enough, but surely some people would want to consume it. And, you know, if we're talking about building hospitals and 
getting more people uh, malaria treatments and all this other stuff around the world, and it's going to just transform the world and reduce poverty. We don't just mean people paying down their credit card debt and, and so on. Don't we mean that more stuff is going to be built today? So how does that? So yes, and so the way it would work, the way all that stuff would be regulated, if you want to use that verb, and it, in terms of the intertemporal flow of income and consumption and production, is with that burst of income, the more that households wanted to consume it rather than just using it to pay down their debt or or if it doesn't have to be paid down their debt. They could just invest it, you know, go go buy financial assets with it and then have it grow um, at interest, right? Um, but to the extent that they didn't want to do that, that they wanted to consume some of it, then that would uh, – make interest rates higher than they otherwise would be. And so the, the interest rate is the the mechanism or the term structure of interest rates, if you want to get more complex but accurate, is the way that stuff would, would play out. And so, yeah, if all the households wanted to spend that extra income today on consumption, that would end up, that would drive up real interest rates. And then that would reduce how much companies and you know wealthy individuals or whatever right now would bid on those future space-based resources because you know those things are they would know that oh yeah that's that item's worth whatever 10 billion dollars but in the year 2050 and so how do we know what the present value of that is putting aside development cost you know to to go get the, you know to build the rocket ships or whatever to go get it even putting that stuff aside, well, the, the gross value of that thing is lower today, the higher the interest rate is, right? Because you're discounting that distant um, revenue by a bigger discount rate. And so the present value of that thing, the anticipation of what that thing will be worth in the year 2050 is lower today, the higher interest rates are, other things equal. Okay, so that's how it works. So in other words... If humanity did just try to spend all this new revenue as it flowed in, that would lower the amount people would be bidding on future stuff. And so the idea is that if it really were physically impossible for anybody to consume more today, then to the extent they tried to do it, that would make interest rates zoom way up and it would... Um, not allow for people to bid much on those future resources. So there wouldn't be much to, to spend it on. All right. It's actually more the other way around that to the extent that people were willing to save all this flow of new auction revenue that would push down interest rates. Okay. So that, that's probably, I mean, I, I have my levels correct, but in terms of the causality and the actual changes, that's, that's more, that, that's a possibility as well, okay? So here's how things could manifest themselves, just to, to switch to an easier example, because again, this actually dovetails very nicely with the Bombaverkian framework in which the interest rate, in a sense, shows the preference for present consumption versus future consumption. And so normally what we think of it is as, oh, if people all of a sudden change their, um, if, if their time preference changes and they become more patient, right? So if their time preference goes down and so now they're, they're willing to postpone consumption, oh, that lowers interest rates. And then those, the, the resources freed up from them refraining from t consumption today flow into the hands of the capitalists and they can lengthen the structure of production and then longer, more roundabout production processes make labor and other inputs more physically productive. And so that's kind of how humanity gets to a higher standard of living, right? That, um, rather than just directly harvesting the crops with our bare hands, instead we use some of our labor 
that could have been used to harvest more crops. Instead, we use some of the labor to go build farming equipment. And then our labor next year augmented with that equipment is now much more physically productive. And so now our option set has expanded. And then again, if we just keep doing that at any given time, even if we could just focus everything on immediate consumption, but instead we focus some of our productive capacity on building stuff for the future that will help us down the road, then that's how our standard of living rises continually. Okay, so in that framework, a critical element of that whole approach or worldview is that the subjective preference for present versus future goods plays a key role. And so the, the restructuring of production processes over time has to line up with that in equilibrium. Okay, so again, like I say, normally the way we think it through in these thought experiments is, oh, if everybody all of a sudden becomes more patient and they're willing to reduce consumption today, that's what frees up resources and allows for the adoption of more capitalistic processes, which then explains how we have more consumption down the road. So from any household's individual financial point of view, they don't need to know what's going on under the hood and how is this physically possible that, oh yeah, I could buy 10 apples today, but if I just am patient and the current interest rate is 10%, that if I wait a year, I can go buy 11 apples. And so there's a sense in which you can transform physically 10 apples today into 11 apples a year from now. And so to understand, you know, the Bombavrix stuff is necessary to understand how is that physically possible? But it lines up with, you know, your subjective preferences. And by the same token, if you're willing um, to, to have the trade-off be smaller so that, oh yeah, I would, um, rather than consuming 19 today, just to have 20 next year, well, then that allows for more resources to go into roundabout processes and so on. Okay, so that's normally the way you do it, but you can do it the other way too, and that's what's more relevant here for this space example. And actually, yeah, it, it, it would cause interest rates to go up is um, we're chugging along here, and then all of a sudden we believe that there's just going to be a lot more consumption available one year from now. And so what does that do today? That it, it actually increases on the margin, the preference for future, for present consumption, excuse me. And so on the margin, that would make the rate of time preference higher and would result in a higher equilibrium interest rate. All right. That effectively, it, it'd be like if you, um, Let's say you're living in a real modest apartment and everything, and you got a very mediocre job, and then you win the lotto, right? And you know you're, you're not worried that they're going to change the rules on you or something, and you're, you know you're going to get a check for a million dollars next year. Well, you can uh, – you don't have to just keep living in your apartment, in your, you know, mediocre apartment, whatever. You can borrow against that future income – and get into a much nicer place if somebody is available to lend you the money to do that, okay? And so the idea is if humanity in general all of a sudden is, is trying to consume more in anticipation of the higher physical productivity that's going to be available in the year 2050, then that's going to push up interest rates. But then the very act of them doing that discounts – today's value of those potential future resources. So that's, that's the interplay and how stuff all balances. And so notice what happens is it, it, it's not merely a wash. There really are physical changes that could occur in order to render all these plans um, consistent with each other. All right, so in the Bombaverkian framework, there's this notion of what's called the subsistence fund. Now, Later on, we, we dropped that term and Mises explains in human action that that's not really helpful because it's not just a matter of bare subsistence, but you can understand where he's coming from. The idea was the capitalists, the, the idea in the hands of Bambavark, who, who was just you know taking it from the, the classical economists, 
The idea of the subsistence fund was the capitalists accumulate this stockpile of goods that will tide the workers over. Because the workers, they don't, they don't want to save. They're living hand to mouth. They get their real wages or, you know, they get their money wages and then they go right out and spend it. And, you know, they buy food for their family and they pay their rent and they go drink in the saloon or whatever. And so in order for society to shift away from more present oriented production activities uh, in order to make things intermediate tools and equipment that augment workers' productivity down the road, there's a smaller group of far-sighted individuals who engage in saving. And so they live below their means and they stockpile a subsistence fund. And so now if you want to hire some of the workers to stop making the stuff that's immediately being consumed today and divert their efforts so they work on things that aren't going to really pay off until a few years down the road, well, how are those workers going to eat in the interim? And so that's what the subsistence fund is for. And so that's the, the role that the capitalists play in that classical framework. And again, Bambavik kind of took Menger's subjective value theory and integrated it into the old classical framework of how this stuff works physically. And so the idea is the capitalists, if you want to say like, what, what do they contribute to this process? Well, by them saving and accumulating goods in the present, they finance the ability of the workers to, um, again, divert themselves from making stuff that's for immediate consumption into more far-sighted goals because the workers themselves, I mean, the, the workers can save and you can do that. As a worker, you can save some of your income and you know, then you're a worker and a capitalist simultaneously, right? So I'm not trying to make it, I'm, I'm just explaining the classical framework. They were definitely distinct groups in society of people, but more generally, the people can bounce around into various roles, but that's, that's how it works. And so likewise here, you could imagine if people are convinced that, oh yeah, year 2045, 2050, we're going to have all this flow of stuff from space-based activities that are really, it's really going to enhance the technical productivity of labor here on earth, that people who wanted to start enjoying the fruits of that before it came online, that could be physically possible by capitalists right now drawing down their savings. And they could say, all right, yes, I'm going to effectively bid on that those future resources. You know, I'm going to be the one reaping the lion's share of that down the road. And in exchange, right now, I'm going to draw down my savings and finance everybody's higher consumption in the meantime. All right, so that's that's how it would work physically, okay? So, I mean, you can picture if some guy is sitting on 100 coconuts and the people on the island pick a coconut a day and then he wants to hire them for 100 days to build a boat so that he can go out and get more fish or something, he can just feed them coconuts while they build the boat. Because if, if, if he didn't have his stockpile of coconuts, they, they just couldn't do it. They said, no, we can't take 100 days to build a boat because we'll starve to death. And so he can say, all right, well, I'll do that. Uh, here, I'll feed you. And he's effectively drawing down his savings. And then, but that's why he now owns the boat at the end of that. Because the workers are just doing like, okay, yeah, I could pick a coconut a day with my bare hands, or this guy's going to give me a coconut a day to build this boat. And then he gets to, you know, it's his boat. When he's all said and done, he's just hiring me for my my daily labor. And that's how the thing could work. All right. So that's a, a very Bombaverkian, Robinson Crusoe application of the idea. All right. So likewise, right now, there are capitalists who, it's, again, it's not just some guy in a top hat. It's people with savings, just even households or whatever, that have been very frugal. And I'm saying it's not merely that you have numbers in your 401k, there, that corresponds to physical realities. And so I'm saying the structure of production on earth could retool itself and change its orientation such that more labor and other resources start cranking out more television sets and passenger vehicles over the next five years than it otherwise would have. 
and it's okay, assuming everybody's expectations are roughly correct, it's okay to do that because the extraterrestrial resources start coming into the system down the road to make it all sustainable. So that the, the fact that we reduce our reinvestment in the capital stock over the next 10 years doesn't, we're not being profligate and consuming capital because it's like, oh, no, no, it's, it's fine for us to do that. We've got this stuff coming, you know, online pretty soon. Just like in the island example, the guy who has 100 coconuts and he, every day, you know, it starts, it dwindles as he's hiring the workers to build the boat. So long as his expectations are correct and the boat really does allow them to go catch a bunch of fish, he's fine. Now, if it turned out that, oh, there are no fish, well, he's in trouble. Then he just consumed all of his coconuts and blew his savings. So likewise, if humanity you know, retools itself and builds more houses and cars and whatever for poorer people over the next 20 years, thinking there's this huge influx of stuff from outer space that's going to come in, and then it just ends up they're wrong, well, th that will be an issue. But assuming they're correct and they have the incentive to be correct because they're the ones bidding on it, it's their money on the line – then you can see how that's physically possible in this. And, it's, and that's what I mean when I say financial markets can, quote, pull forward resources from the future to allow a higher standard of living today. Okay, so that's the crash course in fun Austrian intertemporal economics. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. See you next time. Check back next week for a new episode of the Human Action Podcast. In the meantime, you can find more content like this on Mises.org.